And I'm going to hand it away to you, Natalie. Hi, good morning, afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're connecting from today. Y un saludo en especial a los asistentes de Latinoamérica. Un gusto tenerlos acá con nosotros hoy. Um, we are going to go ahead and start our final webinar today, developing on DSpace with Art Lowell and Andrea Bellini. Next, please. Next slide. Okay. Um, just a little overview of the workshop schedule. Um, we'll have short introductions, then we'll move on to understanding the REST API with Andrea, and then right into customizing and developing with the DSpace UI with Art, and then we'll have a half an hour for questions and answers. And we'll explain how the Q&A works in a moment here. And I just wanted, before we started, to take a moment to remind the DSpace community at large that DSpace wouldn't be possible without your expertise and financial support. DSpace software is financially supported by the community via membership dues, certified partners and service providers, and various fundraising efforts. Current pledges and campaigns are the DSpace Development Fund, the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services, known as SCOS, and if you've been enjoying the benefits of working with this open source community and software product, please consider contributing to one of our fundraising campaigns in the coming year. You can read more about them and make your final contribution or membership commitment via the fundraising section of the DSpace website or the links that my colleague Tim Donahue has put in the chat. Okay, next slide. Okay, and I'm just gonna do a short introduction of our two presenters today. Um, Andrea Bellini is Chief Technology and Innovation Officer at Science and actively involved in various international open source and open standards communities with leading roles, DSpace committer, deputy, deputy leader of SERIF and architecture task group of Euro CRIS and member of the COAR next Generation Repositories Editorial Group, Chair, Speaker, and Reviewer for several key conferences. He holds an MSc in Applied Mathematics and a Master's in ICT Management. And Art Lowell has been working with these base at Admire since 2007 and has been in charge of research and development there since 2013. He became a DSpace committer in 2016. Before DSpace 7, Art worked mainly on the XML UI, where he played a big part in creating the Mirage themes. He has been working on the UI for DSpace since the original prototype, and notable contributions include the data services, menu system, and dynamic themes. Uh, welcome, everybody, and it's off to you, Andrea. Oh, I think you have one more slide, Natalie. <laughs> to introduce the Q&A. Yes, yeah, so today we are managing questions and answers via a document. Um, just get the link here for you in the chat. Um, so you can click on that link and add your questions, please, to the bottom of the document under the November 17th heading um, during the presentations and um, yeah, that's how we're gonna be managing the questions and answers. And I'll peri periodically add that link again to the chat for you. Okay, and now we're ready to go. Thank you, Natalie, for this nice introduction. Welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm going to um, talk a bit about REST API, mostly from the perspective of Angular user and developer of the um, user interface. So what you need to know to um, work with the REST API of this space. So first of all, for who you are uh, uh, not new to the space community, you are probably aware that since this space uh, version four, uh, we have implemented uh, our REST API. We started with our read-only uh, REST API in version four and moved to uh, read write API in a uh, more recent version. But in any case, this REST API was very limited and only a partial 
uh, only few feature of uh, this space was included in the REST API. Um, it was not based on uh, uh, REST based practice. Uh, it was very, very custom, a bit uh, complicated to work uh, with. And also from the implementation perspective, it was all uncrafted work. So it was difficult for new developers to understand how to work with this stuff. So we decided to implement a completely new REST API. And we switched completely to approach here we decide that we want to go for an API first approach. So everything needs to be available on the REST API before we can implement a feature. The user interface is completely based on the REST API. So it's technically impossible for this space to provide you a feature if this feature is also not ready available on the REST API. We decided to write down a good documentation, so what we call REST contract, so that we are sure that uh, the request format, the response format are known and are as much uniform and standard as possible. To do that, we will follow two main standards, uh, the HETIOS uh, principle and the health format. And we decided to do that building on top of very common technology and understood technology among Java developer. So we look heavily to the Spring technology for our uh, foundation. And which is the goal, the benefit of an API first approach. The uh, side effect is then we have all the capability to have the best third party API uh, integration. So everything that you can do from the user interface can be also done programmatically via the REST API. This is quite powerful. Um, we have a um, presentation science, um, uh, a previous open repository where you will see different uh, example of scenario where you can use the REST API to integrate this space with other system. So how you can interact with the REST API and you can learn about REST API. Uh, we will touch briefly all of these aspects uh, today. Uh, there are several ways. The most obvious one, the most useful, uh, uh, in my opinion, is to just observe what Angular, the Angular user interface is doing uh, using the web developer tool of your browser. So your Chrome, Firefox browser have this tool integrated and you can inspect what is going on behind the sign. This space also includes uh, what is named a null browser, so an independent open source project that allows you to explore the uh, REST API. And of course, you can use command line tool like curl, get, or other, other to, to query our REST API. And also we will tell something about Postman. Uh, just a last note, of course, the goal of REST API is that you can integrate with other system. These other system could be Java-based, PHP, or whatever language you prefer. And any language have the basic tool to interact with a REST API, just HTTP requests, essentially. We don't have yet a client uh, SDK that uh, will facilitate uh, this integration. It could be a nice project, side project for you to start, maybe on GitHub, and we would be very happy to to, um, to know about this project and support maybe in the space lab or things like that. So how to access the uh, developer web tool? Nothing surprising, but if you have Chrome on the um, tool uh, menu, you can just look to more tools and you have the link to access the developer tools. If you access the home page of the space seven of the demo of the space seven from the web tool, uh, you will see that several requests, several HTTP requests are performed and it will be very convenient to just filter all the requests, the network requests uh, to look on fetch uh, cross script uh, request. Just zooming onto a web tool panel, uh, you will see that for instance, one of the first requests is a status request. This is one of the endpoint of the REST API that is used to discover if there is already a logged in user or not and get information about the logged in user. In this case on the right side, you will see 
uh, that uh, um, the OK attribute means essentially that the REST API is working and inspected, and uh, you don't have any authenticated user yet. And this corresponds to the fact that the user interface will show you the login menu and not an already logged in user with the tail about the logged in user. So, but if you look to the uh, home page of, uh, um, of the space, you will see that one of the widgets available is the top community, the list of top community that we have in our repository. But uh, if you compare what request has been done when you have access the first time this home page, you will see that there is nothing related to the top community. So why this is missing? Where is this uh, request? This request is missing because this space uses an architecture based on server-side rendering. So essentially, Hart will tell more, will show you a nice flow diagram to explain that. But essentially, what this space do is to uh, trigger uh, the generation of a static HTML page uh, generated on server-side by Node that is delivered to your browser. So if you don't have a JavaScript capability on your browser, you still get the content. And this content has been uh, built on the server side. This is useful for, um, for crawling, so for uh, search engine optimization, but it's also uh, very good for uh, loading time optimization because Initially, all the requests has been fetched by on the server side, and just the result has been delivered by, uh, to, the, uh, to the browser. What we try to do is to reuse as much as possible what has been already done on the server side. So this is packaged in a JSON file that you will see inside your source of your HTML page, and this is named uh, state transfer or ngrx state rededation. So for this reason, you don't see the uh, request to the top community. How you can see this request in your browser? You can see this uh, actually all the requests if you start from another page. So open your browser uh, and point, for instance, to the search of uh, this space uh, demo. In this case, the list of requests will be um, larger. And one of these requests is a top request. So to, the end point related to the search of all top community in this space. And here you will get metadata. Inside our response, you have uh, several community. The first community have a title that is just a couple of zero. And this is exactly what we see on the home page today for our demo. So this is the community. Uh, what is this strange JSON format? Uh, is not something that we have invented, but we rely on a common standard. So the JSON uh, format that we use for our response is TL format. It's uh, built on uh, um, uh, in an hierarchical way so that uh, inside the JSON, we have some uh, attributes that are plain old JSON property. We have a set of links that uh, relate what we are uh, retrieving from the REST API with other endpoint, with other resources available on our REST API, and uh, the possibility to embed resources that are linked uh, from our um, current object. So for instance, if we have community, we have the metadata of the community, but we have the links to point to all the sub-community and collection in this community. And we can decide to embed this information directly in the JSON file to save uh, bandwidth and reduce the number of HTTP requests. So using this standard format, what we are able to provide is uh, uh, out of box and uh, an explorer uh, is an open source project based uh, the help browser that understand this format and allow you to explore the REST API of this space, providing a nice uh, user interface over our REST API. It's important to understand that this is an independent and open source project. It's not something that the space developer have built. This just works because we use an OTL format, a standard. And what do to the help browser? As it know the uh, TL format is able to parse our response and to separate information that are just attribute state information about the resource that we have requested 
and provide us all the links and embedded resources in a specific interface. And using these links, we can navigate our, uh, our REST API. So also without uh, previous um, known uh, about our REST API, we don't know which are all our endpoint. You can just point to the entry point to the REST API uh, index page of our um, uh, REST API, and you can browse and to discover the list of community, to, to search uh, our browser, the status of the authentication, and so on. Looking to standard, we have also decided to try to be as much uniform as possible. So a very common question is about pagination of collection of resources. When we want to, uh, we decide to have everything paginated by default. So you cannot perform any REST API request that uh, would uh, generate a very high load on the system and uh, maybe produce a down of the system because you download all the information just in one single step. Everything is paginated. It's paginated using a uniform approach and are exposed uh, um, uh, how this is, is visible on the user interface, for instance. If on the home page, the top community component also show pagination. And when you click on the, on the uh, number two of the pagination, you move, essentially the Angular browser is just following the link next in, uh, uh, um, in our uh, response to, to to perform the, the subsequent REST request to download the, the next page of result. And so this is what happened. Just this fragment will be updated and we will get the new pagination where the first community is this one that is named 000 Geologia. So in the help browser from the, in the help document, what we have is to include all the pagination link in the, uh, in the link section. So if you look to the help browser, you will see this section where you have for any pagination, any paginated collection, you will have the link to the first page, to the current page, to the next page, and the last page in uh, this pagination series. And you will have access to uh, the list of endpoints that allow you to perform some search some filtering over this REST collection. Uh, which is another common uh, pitfall of REST API. Uh, REST API usually could become very expensive on, in terms of uh, uh, HTTP requests if they are very granular. So if you just ask for metadata of an item, uh, in, in a request and you need to get uh, the list of bstream in this item, the list of metadata for each of these bstream. If you perform that all uh, with all separated uh, HTTP requests, the cost of the transport could be too expensive and could not provide uh, good enough performance. So what usually is done is to uh, apply the concept that is named projection that allow you to ask in a single uh, pass, in a single request to include into response uh, some detail about the link identity. And you can define uh, which detail you are interested in. So you can ask to include full graph of object uh, related to your request up to um, default uh, depth, of course. So the default is two. Or you can decide to go deeper and specific, specifying exactly which level of depth you want to reach. Or you can also define, decide to say, okay, I'm interested uh, in, uh, uh, in an item, but I also want to have uh, immediately the logo of the owning collection of this item. Or I'm interested to have the detail about the submitter of this item. Uh, one important thing to keep in mind is uh, the projection respect the security. So if you try to follow the path to discover um, reserved information, this will be prevented by, uh, by the backend and you will not get any 
detail that should be not disclosed to you. Authentication, uh, we aim to be, uh, we are serverless, uh, sorry, we are stateless. Uh, that means that we don't have any session on, uh, on the server side to implement authentication in a stateless uh, um, architecture. The, the common practice is to use uh, web token, authentication token. And this is what also the space recipe I have done. All the previous space authentication methods are still supported. So you can log in uh, using LDAP, Shibboleth, uh, ORCID uh, and uh, OIDC now, that is a new feature of the space seven. But in all case, regardless to which uh, authentication method you will use, at the end you will have uh, uh, a, JW, a JWT token uh, back from the SCPI. So a token string that you need to pass in each subsequent request to stay authenticated. How it will look like? So when you perform a login, uh, this is just a login request that is performed against uh, password authentication. Uh, you could inspect eventually the payload where you will see the username password that has been posted. Uh, but the interesting part is then in the response header, you will get back to Beater token, the JWT token. This long string uh, is a standard. It's a standard and you can inspect the value of this, uh, uh, of this string, uh, for instance, on JWT.io. Uh, this string is composed of several parts. The first part, the header, of this token uh, tell the system which algorithm, hashing algorithm you are using. The second part will be the payload where we can provide signed uh, uh, data about uh, authenticated users. So we, in our case, we include the UID of the authenticated person and the expiration time of, the, of this login and the special group that are assigned to this user. This information has been signed on the server side. So you cannot modify this information uh, without invalidate uh, the signature. And to verify the signature, of course, you need to know a secret that is only known to the backend side. Uh, due to some technicality, some authentication method still require the use of cookie, of temporary cookie. This is, for instance, the case for Shibboleth. In this open potential uh, uh, the space to cross uh, script uh, referee for gateway uh, requests. So a specific kind of attack that can be performed. To prevent this, to, to protect the space against this kind, uh, this sort of attack, we have implemented the, the double summit cookie protection technique. That is a recommendation from the uh, of us uh, community. What does uh, mean? Uh, if you inspect um, the request, you will see that there is a special cookie and a special header that will be uh, always match and will be checked on the uh, server side uh, to verify if uh, uh, any hacker has tried to um, ajack your uh, request. But we will see a detail uh, later on. So another interesting uh, uh, example is when you try to make modification to your data. So the most common way to do that, the most powerful uh, feature in the space is the, the submission. Uh, we know that, this, that the space submission is very flexible. There is a lot of things that you can configure and uh, you are going to save uh, a modification to an item piece by piece. So you will have the author, the title, and things like that. How you get to this page? So essentially, this is just a new submission that I have started. To get in this page, uh, several requests have been performed. So initially, you have a post request over the workspace item uh, rest collection that uh, uh, return a 201, so a created response code, because you have created the empty workspace item that you want to edit. After that, the user interface is performing a set of uh, several GET requests to retrieve all the detail about the configuration of the submission form. 
So which field are required in each, uh, in each panel? Uh, which option of accessibility do you have when you upload a file? If it can be open access under embargo or things like that. When you really perform a change, uh, you need to, um, to perform a patch request. So you want to change our JSON representation of our workspace item to modify some of these attributes. Again, we decide to follow a standard that best practice in the uh, interest API world. And we adopt the, the JSON patch specification. Essentially, this JSON patch specification allow you to express the change that you need to perform over your uh, JSON representation as a set of uh, operation with uh, metadata information that need to be added, modified, or removed, and so on. So the JSON that the request is change look like that is an array where you have several operation in it and you ask to remove some part of your JSON object, add other information, replace or move. Maybe you want to move author uh, inside that group, put the first author at the end or things like that. On the browser, you can observe that if you put, for instance, my name as author and click on the save button, uh, the browser will show you that there is there are some missing mandatory information, and under the hood, a patch request will be performed uh, with uh, the JSON um, patch uh, request that include a NAD operation. You want to add the information where Bolini Andrea is one of two authors that is required in the first panel of the configuration that is named traditional page one. And if you look to the, um, this is just a zoom in onto the tail. If you look uh, to the preview, to the response, you will see that after this patch, the object has been updated. So the panel now contains the information that we have just patched, but also uh, the, our uh, workspace item contain a new error section that uh, include detail about uh, which metadata, which section are mandatory and not yet filled. For this reason, Angular is able to display the, the red hint with uh, uh, missing mandatory information. So another nice thing about uh, um, about the web tool is then you can just click right uh, right click on each request and you can copy also the core representation of this request. So this could be a very convenient way to extract from your browser the request that maybe you need to perform on uh, a server script or another uh, language. And if we look to the detail of the previous patch request in curl, we will not alter the tail that we have already introduced. So it's a patch request because we want to modify, partially modify an item. We are just touching some aspect of this item. It contained uh, um, the cross site scripting uh, project uh, protection because contained the cookie and uh, um, the header XSRF token. It contains a correlation ID that is automatically generated by Angular and would help you to debug what is going on on the backend, looking for this UID in your log file, because all the requests, all the log line generated by this browser session will have this UID. So you can follow the user on your log. And you will have the JWT token for the authentication. So these are the detail about who was logged in, uh, who had performed this request. And at the end, we have the real JSON patch. So what we want to change on the object. So last but not least, I want to let you know that we have also a postman uh, uh, collection specific for this space is available on the space labs uh, GitHub repository. So you can download the default settings for this uh, uh, common user tool uh, to explore REST API. Um, 
it's uh, already include uh, uh, all the requests are configured using a variable. So it's very easy, convenient to switch from one environment to another. So you can check your request against the demo or your local uh, environment. You can switch between one user to another. And uh, the, uh, the pre-script, the pre-execution script will uh, take care of uh, all the login dance so that you will get uh, JW token uh, for your post and, and uh, patch request, for instance. If you are a Postman user, please contribute back to the GitHub repository. So we want to enhance this, uh, this collection. If you have example of other endpoint or if you found something that is uh, wrong due to change in the contract, please open an issue on pull request. They will be very appreciated. Uh, another information to keep in mind is that we have a markdown repository where all our uh, REST contract, REST documentation is available. Also in this case, please uh, open issue, pull request if you found anything that is missing or is wrong. It's very important that we keep this repository up to date and uh, um, we appreciate your help on that. I will left in the, um, in the slide, just a cheat sheet where all, you have all cross reference for our REST API terminology that maybe will help you in the future to explore uh, the new space REST API. And with that, I leave the floor to Art. Thanks, Andrea. Okay. Uh, I'm definitely going to try out those Postman uh, tools. I had no idea, but I use it and logging in can be a bit annoying. So I'll try it. Can you see my screen now? Should be just a blank desktop. Yes, we can, Art. Excellent. So uh, I'm going to show a few code examples while I'm doing this. So I'm not going to go full screen with the presentation so I can switch in and out easily. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how you customize the DSpace UI. I'm going to focus mostly on uh, theming because uh, that's the first way and the easiest way to get into it. And if you like what you're doing, then you can get into that further uh, by changing the base theme as well. But theming uh, works with template examples and is the easiest way to get into it. So let's start with a brief introdu introduction on Angular. What is it and how does it work? Um, well, Angular is a, a framework in JavaScript for building applications on the browser. Uh, so the UI is, uh, the HTML is rendered via JavaScript, uh, actually TypeScript in Angular, which is a language based on JavaScript, built on top of JavaScript. And uh, then uh, it uses data from the REST API, uh, as Andrea just explained in JSON, uh, and it uses that to render it. So this is quite uh, a complicated uh, schematic, but uh, let me walk you through it. So what happens if you visit an Angular page, uh, the initial request uh, goes to the node server on the, on the front end, and that fetches uh, the, renders the page by fetching requests from the REST API and, and to create an HTML file, send it entirely to the browser. So that part, basically you don't need JavaScript for that. You get an entirely rendered page. And then afterwards, the JavaScript starts up in the browser and all uh, following requests will uh, happen only via a REST request. And then you get the JSON back and then Angular in your browser renders the same thing. So this allows, uh, as Andrea mentioned, um, uh, uh, bots and spiders or, or other users that don't have JavaScript to uh, just use it as it was any other site and uh, just run the same code, pretend it's all rendered service site. Um, an Angular application is built out of components. Uh, th those are, in essence, new HTML tags uh, that come with their own code and styling. So if you have a look at the screenshot, everything you see here is a component. So the main uh, green border, that's the entire app. That's a DS, DS app tag. You have a header, uh, the breadcrumbs, item page, uh, thumbnail, etc. So I'll, I'll show that briefly in the console here. Uh, perhaps I can zoom in on this a bit. Uh, so here you have the DS app. And then if we inspect this, you have uh, the news uh, here. 
you have the, the search form, all custom tags that are components in the codes uh, that come with their own uh, JavaScript and CSS and HTML. So um, each component consists of a, a TypeScript file, that's the JavaScript, um, an HTML uh, that contains a markup, and an SCSS file that contains a style. So here's an example for the header. So if you have a header component that has this uh, decorator at the top that uh, says the, the tag is going to be DS header, and you can find the style here and the HTML there. Uh, uh, the for the style we're, uh, we we well we started off using Bootstrap uh, back in 2017 and Bootstrap uses SAS. Uh, SAS is a CSS preprocessor that gave you things like variables and and mixins and functions, uh, and it allows us to nest CSS rules and and, and etc. And Bootstrap uses these variables to configure everything about it: colors, fonts, spacing. But uh, the downside is that SAS variables can be resolved at build time. You have to compile their values into it. Uh, can, it can only be resolved at build time. You have to compile their values into it and you can't uh, change them at, on the fly. So in order to support dynamic uh, teams, um, we started using native CSS variables. Uh, that's a more recent change uh, to solve the same problem SAS already solved, but they can be changed on the fly and we uh, use them to support uh, the dynamic swapping of black like, colors. If you have multiple teams uh, in the same repository, you go to a different page that has a different team, we need to be able to swap the variables out. So uh, in order to support both Bootstrap and CSS, uh, we created a mapping. So every Bootstrap SAS variable is mapped on a dash dash BS uh, CSS variable. And in the basic components of these space, we can only use these CSS variables. So that way they are dynamic. Uh, however, if you just write your team and you, you, you don't do development for the community, you can just simply use the SAS variables if you like, um, because uh, as long as you're within the same team, it, it doesn't matter. Only for components that need to support multiple teams do you need to use the CSS variables. I mentioned them, however, because all custom variables, these space edits uh, are these CSS variables. We, we won't add any new CSS variables because it's an extra step for us. It's inconvenient. So how do you go about creating a new team? Uh, there is a custom team folder uh, in, the, in the SRC team. So if you have your project here, uh, so this is the root of your project. You have the SRC folder here in, uh, teams, you have a, a custom folder, and that folder contains every teamable component in DSpace. So the easiest way to start with a team is just to copy that folder uh, uh, to, to what you want your team to be. Uh, because you have to restart your server after you do so, I've already done this here. I've copied this to uh, the workshop team. And that contains all, all components we might need. Uh, something else you need to do to uh, enable your team is to go to angular.json and basically add another global CSS file for your team. So uh, you do that by just duplicating the one that's already there for custom and uh, adding that here. I've called it workshop and workshop team. Uh, then you enable your team in the configuration. You just say uh, in config.yml, you, you add a teams option and you say name is workshop. By default, that will be named dspace. And then the last thing you need to do is go to the teams, uh, SRC teams eager team modules file and uh, add your team uh, in these imports here. And the reason for that will become clear at the end, but it's so we can uh, team uh, more complicated components uh, that use decorators. And if we get to it at the end, I'll, I'll give a bit more explanation then. Um, so uh, there is also, uh, besides from the custom team, there is also the DSpace team, which is the one you see if you just go to the demo site. It contains an example team, uh, like I just explained, it started from the custom folder, it changes some colors, the news, the header, and if you prefer it, the look of it, and you can start from that instead of the custom folder, because then you're already part of the way there. But for this team, we're going to start from the custom folder, and as I explained, uh, I created a workshop team, uh, added the CSS to angular.json, enabled it in config.yml, and added that eager team module to the imports. 
So now what you need to do if you want to team a component is you want to go to that component in uh, your team folder and uh, you want to, uh, uh, well, no, first of all, let's take a step back. So uh, as I explained here, let's say you want to compo uh, team the, the search form here. Uh, you just take that selector and you uh, look for it in your team. <laughs> Uh, it seems that this is not a teamable component. Let's say home home news then, for example, and you find home news. Uh, you look for that and then you get a, a team component like this. Uh, in order to start using it, by default, it will always refer to the default implementation from DSpace, but it all already has uh, an extra HTML and CSS file. So if you want to start overriding it, you can just go and switch the comments around and then your own files can be used. And those are just empty files and you can start using them right away. So we're in the homepage news thing. And uh, this should be compiled in a second. And now we should see that. So this is basically just a server I started by running uh, yarn run start in uh, the root of the component. And there you go, it works. So um, the first thing most people want to do when they customize their team is uh, add their, their logo, their branding. So you can do that by adding it to the images, assets images folder in your team folder and then teaming the header components uh, as we just discussed. Um, so yeah, I explained how to do that. Um, so you open uh, the base header components. Uh, in order to make this run a bit quickly, uh, run a bit more quickly, uh, I've created one uh, earlier. Oh, well, I need to undo the changes I made. Uh, so I've made each, these changes earlier. Um, so let's go to the header team components. And what I did is, uh, I swapped, the, uh, swapped uh, the HTML around, not the CSS, because I didn't I need to change that. Then I went to the original header, copied that, went back, uh, swapped it around, uh, pasted it here, and then I just updated the URL to the logo. Important to know here is that you need to put your team uh, name in this. So you put this, the, you put the logo in assets images, but the URL will always contain the team. So it has to be assets, team name, images, logo. And then it adds the logo here. Now, usually when I do a, a demo like this, uh, I get <laughs> invited by a university or something. Here I had to get creative. So we're just calling it workshop repository and I made a little logo. Um, the next thing you probably want to do is uh, change your color scheme. So uh, we're going to that's going to do mainly have to do with customizing bootstrap variables. And there's a, uh, a file in the team styles folder called uh, SAS variable overrides. Uh, that's this one here, which is where you can do your overrides uh, for bootstrap variables. You can find all the variables you can customize uh, in this folder here. That's that just uh, bootstraps main file and contains them all. So I've, picked these couple of colors uh, to work with the new logo. And um, you can also overwrite the, the CSS variables in uh, the CSS variable overrides file. And you can find them all in this file right here. Uh, and uh, for this example, I uh, just changed the link color for the nav bar and the header icon. I think the note here is that you can just use the SAS variables in here as well. Uh, so so that's, that's, that's what this is doing. This is saying resolve the SAS variable and assign it to a DSpace variable, uh, the CSS variable. So let's take a look at what that's doing. So I added the colors. Uh, I started just by uncommenting everything that was here and then I just changed a few colors I wanted. The reason for that is because this team colors map is customized. And so everything that's used here needs to be defined, but most of these I haven't changed, only the ones I mentioned in the slide. So that should look a bit like this. Uh, it's not dramatic. Uh, this is a bit yellow now. This is uh, dark, this is dark. Uh, 
and the footer is a brighter blue. So uh, a font is also something you're going to want to do. Uh, it's a simple import in uh, this file right here, the SAS variable overrides file. Just uh, add the, the, uh, the font you want to use at the, at the import and then use the font here. So if we'll do that, it should change right now. I have a, an import. You can get that from like Google Fonts will give you give you that line. Uh, and then you can just use the font family here. And we should see vSpace 7 is now uh, a different font here. Um, then customizing the footer is something you want to do. Now, I went into a lot of detail, because, but um, we're running a bit late, so let's keep this brief. Uh, the By default, DSpace has uh, a, a really small footer, but we, we noticed that a lot of people want uh, uh, an extensive footer to add some more links, uh, so it has a, 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 an option built in to, to make this a two-parter. So that's what I did. Um, I went to the, the workshop team footer components. And I again swapped these two around. And then I added show top footer true. And so this is something custom to DSpace and to the footer, footer component. That's just a, a, a property from the base component uh, that you can overwrite. By default, it's false. You can just add it to true in your overridden components. And then again, I copied the HTML, uh, pasted it here, and then I tweaked some of the content, uh, added some uh, different clothes, uh, colors, <laughs> and uh, we ended up with something like this. But by default, I basically didn't do much to it. I just uh, changed the colors uh, and changed the alignment of the text here. I believe by default, this is centered. But this, this two-parter is basically a default part of uh, the DSpace footer component. Uh, and you can find the details in the slide deck if you're really interested. Uh, so for the homepage news is something most people are going to want to customize. Uh, so I did again the same thing. I found the home news components. Uh, so again, let's, uh, I, yeah, I, I used that example before. So uh, you can use, you find it using the selector in the, the this folder here. And then, um, you can swap these around. Uh, for this one, I just started from scratch. I didn't copy anything. I just added a class with a banner. Uh, and then I put some text in between. Uh, I put the logo on top as well. And I chose uh, a, a photo from just, uh, can, can I follow this link? No, it, that doesn't work. Just from like an open source, uh, images site, which I thought was nice and worked with the logo. Uh, and I think I broke the image because it's not loading. Hmm. Live demos are always brave, Art. Yeah, I keep doing <laughs> this to myself. <laughs> it happens. Yeah, um, but it should be in the right place. I tested it before. Uh, I think the server just didn't pick up uh, live that the image was added and restarting it should fix it, but this is going to take a little longer. Is there anything else? Well, let's let's go more into a stepwise fashion of what I did. So I added a banner uh, and then the image, and I added uh, the CSS to use the image as the background of the banner. And the background size cover will do that thing where you never see the edge. So, so the, uh, the image will always fill up the entire diff. And uh, no matter how big or small you make it, the image will already always resize uh, the fit. So it will crop it, crop the sides that is uh, the narrowest. Uh, then I bumped up uh, the the image because every page you see here uh, is done. Uh, excellent. So if you go to a different page, you'll see 
there's always a bit of margin at the top here and that's not very nice if you have a, a nicely colored uh, background image so i added uh, a negative margin for that so that's what this is doing it just uses the the variable we have for that margin at the top and uh, i added margin top minus one so uh, that disappears um I added some content, okay, uh, and then, then we ended up with this. Uh, one final thing I wanted to talk about, which uh, we've got a lot of questions about and I had never really covered in one of these talks, is uh, teaming dynamic components. We have a lot of these components in DSpace uh, that are already dynamic. For example, uh, this is a list of items and you, items can be uh, different can have different entity types so we have these variable components uh, that are selected uh, on the fly uh, to determine what this list item should look like so this is going to be like a publication component um, here you have a, a collection list component etc and all these are, are were already dynamic so if you want to make these already dynamic teams team uh, components teamable uh, you have to do two extra things uh, they all have a decorator uh, to, to define them as such a, a listable object component. And then you have to add the team name as the last parameter of the decorator. And that's so that the uh, algorithm that selects uh, which thing to use in a particular list knows uh, which team it belongs to, but because it can't check the directory. Uh, uh, that Well, you haven't been able to make that work yet. Um, also, what you need to do, and this is where those entry components I talked about at the start come in, is you have to add that to the, the entry components in the eager team module. So we talked about this a little bit. Do I still have it open? No, I don't. So I said you have to import this module here uh, in the eager team modules. And um, that this is the module file that we imported. And this is an entry components array uh, where you can add the new component you want to Add. So I was talking about uh, community lists. So let's add that. Should be added here somewhere. Oh, it was already there. That's right. I didn't have to add it in this case because it was already there. So this is a, a component that has such a decorator, such a listable object decorator. And uh, I added a team name here. And then I have to ensure that it's added here uh, so that when the app starts, it knows that this decorator is there, that this component is there, it has a decorator, so it can choose from it. If you don't do it, it doesn't know your component exists, basically. So uh, for the community list element, uh, I wanted to, uh, well, let's go back. I wanted to uh, add a thumbnail because the recent items uh, here all have thumbnails, but communities might have nice logos. You might want to do something visually attractive with those logos. So uh, what I wanted to do is add thumbnails to those community list components. Again, let's have a little look at where I can find them. So we can see here the closest tag to the, what the, the thing I clicked on is the community list elements. Let's look for that. Well, I already have it open, but let's say you don't. Uh, in your team folder and you can find the component it belongs to. Uh, so by default, it will have this custom tag, but we need to change that to workflow. So let's load the commit that already has done that. A workshop, sorry, not workflow, uh, which is the name of the team. And um, then we can customize it. I did the same thing here. I swapped the one around the comments and I copied the HTML from the original. And then I added a thumbnail. Now, uh, the thing about uh, thumbnail is, of course, uh, that you need another uh, link. So if we, we take a look at uh, a community, can we do that here easily? Uh, here, we'll have the community top list. And you'll see they all have this logo link. 
But this logo link, if you load this page, won't be embedded by default. So we still need to, uh, we either need to embed them in the request, but if you're teaming, that's not easy to do because then you have to uh, uh, change the source code, uh, the DSpace source code. It can stay nicely within your team folder. So what we can do is just uh, request, uh, follow the link uh, for that logo afterwards. So what I did is I went to the grid uh, version of this component. Uh, I, I don't think it's teams, but if we look at the base version, the community grid element component that already had a thumbnail and it already had the code to retrieve the logo. So what this does basically is when anytime you change the object, which is in this case, community is going to check does it have a logo link? If so, resolve that link. So I got that from here and I copied it. So the logo would be loaded. And now you can see it loads the logos. Now, if you have really nice logos, you might wanna take this a little bit further because this is just you know, still a simple list. You can turn this like into like a grid or a slideshow or whatever you like to do with it. Um, but yeah, that's how that works. Um, you can get the code for this webinar uh, at this URL, uh, and I'll pause here for a second so you can also use the QR code uh, if that's the easy way to get the link. And I think that's it. And uh, I think Tim is going to take over now, right? Yes. Um, if you want to just run through the, there's only two more slides here. If you could just take control, I'll let you know when to move along. Um, so first. Yeah, first off, yeah, I want to thank both um, Andrea and Art. Um, I think that's extremely useful. I like the, I also wanted to add, um, I, it's great seeing these presentations move along over time. The last time we did this was several years ago, and it's good to see uh, questions coming out of the community starting to get answered in these talks. Like, I, I think that community collection logo question may have come out of the mailing list, Art, if I recall correctly, but, um, but it was great to see a good example of that. Um, uh, so I had a couple things here in the wrap up just to add um, on to this. So if you want to move to the next slide here. Um, if this um, if this presentation has inspired you to kind of look more at the code, um, play around with DSpace Angular or the REST API, um, I did want to note to folks that we always take contributions from the community. If you're just getting started, a great way to sort of learn and also help us at the same time is to take a look at our good first issue tickets um, in GitHub. And there's also tickets that are labeled help wanted. Those are ones that we're looking for volunteers to chip in on. The good first issue tickets are generally going to be very small. We think that they're not really severe bugs necessarily, but there's something that a new person could pick up, uh, play around with, and when you feel comfortable, send us a pull request. Um, so if you wanna try and help in that way, I would really encourage this is a great way to learn um, on your on your feet, basically. Um, and if you need any help getting familiar with that or where to find all those, the links there go right to the good first issue tickets. Um, you can also send me an email or uh, ping me via Slack because um, we'd love to get others involved just helping out. The more hands we get into the code, the quicker we can all move together. Um, I did also want to note we have a public 7.5 project board. I showed this off in yesterday's talk briefly at the end in the Q&A session. Um, but if you're interested in just helping out to test new code, if you're if that's of interest to you as well, we also love to have testers help us with uh, new development we're working on. So if there's a bug that you've run into and you find that we're already working on a fix for it, um, if you go to our project board and find the pull request there, it'll be under the needs review or assigned column or the under review column. You can always test it for us. Let us know how it works for you. If you notice any issues, give us that feedback because if it works for you and we have a chance to quickly look at it ourselves, that can help us move it into the code base as quick as possible. Um, so those are two ways that brand new people can help out um, immediately into the DSpace project and really help us move forward quicker. So next slide. Um, last, uh, lastly, I wanted to note two ways to contribute um, outside of that. So once you get your feet wet a little bit more, if you want to get even more involved, 
Um, these are two ways to do so. If you are a developer, we have open development meetings every Thursday. Um, that's the DSpace 7 working group. And this meeting, we actually walk through that 7.5 board or whatever the next release is. Uh, we'll take some time looking at what's left, what's coming up, what pull requests have just been created, get them assigned, talk about problems we may be hitting in the code base. It's a pretty technical meeting, but if that's your thing, we welcome anybody to join us and help out there. Uh, you don't have to join those meetings, though, if you want to just give back code. You are welcome to do that just within GitHub um, and get in touch with me if you have any questions on how best to do that. But honestly, you can volunteer for tickets. If tickets are of interest to you, send us pull requests. We will help them get reviewed. You're also welcome to join that process uh, within these development meetings. Um, if you're less technical or just want to talk DSpace with other people who use DSpace, uh, the DCAT meetings are a great place to also do that. That's our repository manager interest group. Um, they meet on a monthly basis with the next one coming up here in mid-December. Um, and this group is very important to provide feedback back to developers and to governance. So they, they do help us with use cases. They help us uh, answer questions about how is this thing used in DSpace? And we want to change the change how this may function. Does this look good uh, to this team? Um, that's the team we go to when the developers have questions that we want um, answered from a user perspective. So if that's of interest to you or you just want to chat with other people who use DSpace and get tips from them, you might consider joining some of those DCAT meetings, and they're publicly posted on the mailing list uh, when they come up. So let's move along here to the last slides. So now it's time for your questions. We have about 29 minutes here, and I know there have been questions already in the public Q&A document. If you want to go to the last slide here, Art, we can leave that up while we're doing some Q&A. Um, I did want to note before we get into the Q&A portion, these workshop slides are immediately available at the first link here. Um, and I'll get that copied into our uh, chat for you all so you can get these slides to take home today. The video will be sent out to all attendees and they will also uh, get the videos for all of the sessions will be posted to the mailing list uh, probably sometime next week. Um, the public Q&A doc, as I mentioned, is at the bottom here. That's that link we've been sharing um, within our chat um, as we go. Um, and that is where you can ask any questions you have about DSpace 7. Uh, we will ensure that they do get answered. They may not all get answered today. And there are many in the last two sessions that we were not able to answer live, um, but they will get answered within that document. So if you ask a question in that document, I'll ensure they do get answered um, uh, uh, back to you. So you get that sort of feedback. Um, but let's go ahead and go to some questions that have been asked in there. And I'm gonna bring some of these back to um, Art and Andrea, of course. Um, so here's here's a first question here. And I, this has been partially answered um, as part of Art's presentation, but um, the question is, are there ready-made themes for DSpace 7? If yes, how can they be configured? I think that you've showed um, a little bit of that, Art, but did you wanna just kind of mention um, anything else about the uh, theming process and what themes are available? Yes, so uh, the, the, the main ready-made team we have, the main example team is the DSpace team. Um, so by default, uh, I, I didn't really explain that, but by default you have, uh, let's find that config file again. The default team is basically actually the base team. We worked on that for the entire development uh, of DSpace 7. Uh, and it is uh, just plain bootstrap. So well, well we, we, we made a couple of tweaks, but we tried to keep everything as vanilla bootstrap as possible to keep make it as steamable as possible, or it doesn't pick up the config file. Um, so, uh, so, so that's what's uh, basically what all the components in the, the main app folder are. They, they use the, the base team. Then the space team sits on top of that. And that's basically a, cost, a copy of the custom team. Uh, custom team, again, doesn't make any changes. This just refers back to the, the base components here. The, the, the space team does make a few changes uh, and um, you can add that on top of that. So that's what you get on, uh, demo.dspace.org. I have to restart my server. I'm not going to do that locally. So I'll put those up side to side, side by side, so you can see the difference. It's almost there. 
So basically this, this home news with the background image, the green line, the, the color scheme, the font, that's all the main DSpace team. And this is the base bootstrap team uh, as you get it. And also when what you start from, I mean, just if you start from the custom team. So those are your two options, basically. Yep, thank you. Um, and I will note um, on top of that as well, if, if folks start to build themes that you find useful, we'd welcome you to, to share them on GitHub. Um, we don't really have like a registry of themes at this point in time, but um, if people start, as people start building themes, um, there is the opportunity to be able to share and reuse and learn from uh, one another as we go. But it's those two main themes out of the box. Uh, let's see, next up here, um, I do want to note, and this came across the chat, this isn't a question, but more of a comment. Pascal Becker from the Library Code had noted that um, to um, Andrea's point about having a client library, that the Library Code um, organization has started a DSpace Python REST client library. Um, and he shared the, the um, link in chat. It is also in that Q&A document. Um, so if folks are interested in using a Python library to interact with the REST API, um, uh, take a look at that um, and may maybe help library code build that out even further. Uh, let's see, other questions here. Um, this might be one for Andrea, um, although I, I think I know the answer to this one as well, but um, someone's asking if there's an example of how to do a deposit um, using the REST API directly. So Andrea, do you happen to, do you know the answer to that one? If not, I can look it up here. Yes, we uh, we have the, um, the request example in the Postman collection. So if you inspect the Postman collection, you will find how to create a new a new workspace item, uh, uh, starting from an empty one and filling all the information, or by uploading uh, um, a PDF file and uh, build the metadata around this PDF file, for instance. And in my today's slide, we also have uh, seen that you can just inspect what the browser do. So essentially you will have a, a post request to create the empty workspace item and a subsequent uh, uh, patch request to fill off the metadata of the section of this workspace item that you need. And if you try to deposit that, uh, you will see the subsequent request that is needed that essentially is to post uh, this object, this workspace item to the workflow endpoint so that the workflow around this workspace item can start. Excellent, yeah, and good to know about that Postman example. I forgot that that was there. Um, I did also find while Andrea was talking, we do have um, some basic documentation on our REST contract around this. Um, I just added that as a link in the chat. Um, I will also copy it into the Q&A document. Um, later on, but there's a submission page of the REST contract that walks you through the basics of the submission process and what endpoints you would use um, to add different data to that. Um, but as Andrea noted, there's an example on Postman and also um, it is very useful to be watching what the user interface is sending to the REST API. That's the easiest way to figure out how to use the REST API endpoints is walking through what Andrea showed us earlier um, and actually watching what the user interface is sending back. Uh, let's see, some other questions here. Some of these are not directly related to development. Let me skip to ones that are more related to things we did today. Uh, this is somewhat related, but um, it's kind of a similar, it might be a question for Andrea more so. Is it possible to make API calls from DSpace to another system? I would like to incorporate information from another source into the deposit forms as well as the search results. Yes, actually, we do that for uh, several external sources. So I, if I remember correctly, this was contributed in 7.2. Uh, we have several imports that allow you to search, for instance, the open air database or also commercial one like Scopus or Web of Science. So you will found, find a piece of Java code that will query this external system and will convert information from the external system into the space format to be imported. And also there is a, um, an extract metadata step is named that you can configure that eventually will be triggered when you put a specific uh, persistent identifier or 
uh, in your submission and will automatically look up the external source to extend your uh, metadata. So this could be Crossref if you put the OI and the metadata will be grabbed automatically from uh, Crossref. Yep, thank you. Just to add to that, Go uh, ahead. The, the, the approach Andrea described is the best approach if you want some, some data that's that's uh, integrated with DSpace and that has to go through the REST API because that, this way we're still uh, contacting uh, DSpace REST API from the Angular UI. If you want to have like a different source, like I don't know, include tweets uh, from somewhere in your homepage, or, or some other web source that's not, not really uh, related to DSpace objects. You could just also use uh, the HTTP client service in Angular uh, to request that, uh, just like the, you'll find lots of examples on how to do that in uh, all the Angular tutorials on the Angular site. That's no different uh, from any, Angular, uh, any other Angular app in DSpace. Excellent, yeah, good point. And that's actually a good transition to what I was gonna ask you both next. Um, one of the questions here is, is there a set of tutorials that you would recommend um, for a crash course in these technologies? So for Angular, uh, for Spring, for REST, um, are there tutorials that you both know about that are useful for us to, to link to um, from these slides and for to provide as resources? And it may, it may be very off the top of your head right now. I realize that, but it might be something that we can provide later on. If there's resources that you all use regularly to train staff to um, uh, to reference any of that it'd be, it'd be useful to uh, share those as far as tutorials that others may find useful so yeah for angular i would definitely say uh, the tutorials on the angular.io site have gotten very good and very uh, comprehensive and uh, the ngrx ones as well because we didn't touch uh, it touch it much because it lies at the very core of these space and you're not going to likely get in, involved with it if you're just customizing it. But uh, Andrea touched on it a little bit. So, that, so the entire state of the application is stored in a, a, an NGRX store. And if you really want to get uh, in deep with the DSpace development, you're going to have to learn how that works. And you can just go to the NGRX site uh, that also has great uh, tutorials on how to use it. Excellent. Good points. I'm going to add links to both those sites into the chat here real quick. Andrea, yeah, do you have any the, recommendations? Go ahead. Yeah, from the Java perspective, uh, I guess that the best source is uh, uh, the Spring Boot tutorial for uh, Spring, uh, Spring Data Rest. It's important to know that we are not using directly Spring Data Rest but we are trying to mimic as much as possible the behavior of Spring Data Rest. So if you follow this tutorial, if you look to their documentation, you will understand a lot of the design that are behind this space, Chris, uh, this space sorry. and you can um, expect uh, that the same approach is used into the space REST API. Excellent. Yeah, I'll have to find those links later. I'm adding just some notes into the chat here, but that's another great resource um, to note here. So let's see. You see what's next here. Um, I'm seeing uh, some, there's a question in the chat um, that um, might be for Art. Um, uh, yeah, in terms of uh, why doesn't the footer and homepage files exist in the themes folder? Um, sometimes they only exist within Only homepage new. Oh, this is talking about the DSpace theme. So uh, why don't um, some uh, components exist in the DSpace theme, uh, whereas they exist in the um, custom theme or elsewhere? Uh, because the custom theme contains everything. Um, but if you, you're ready with your team, you're better off removing everything you don't need because uh, all the components you keep in there that are not needed uh, are only going to add to your compile time. It's not going to make the application bigger because they're only downloaded if they're needed, but it will add to the build time. So for the DSpace team, we cleaned it up and uh, threw everything out that wasn't needed. 
Yeah, and so that's important to realize when you're comparing the DSpace theme versus the custom theme and where you want to start. Um, the custom theme does include every single thing you can possibly theme. Um, so if you start from there, you may want to remove things later on, like Art was saying. Um, your other approach is you can start minimalist um, and start with that DSpace theme, which only includes a couple things you can theme and potentially copy more things into it um, from that uh, custom theme. Yeah. Um, so Go that's ahead. the way you would do that. Uh, if if uh, there's a component you want a team that isn't part of the DSpace team, you can just copy it over in the same relative position from the custom team. And then you do have to remember to add it to the module as well. But then you just look in the custom team modules, where is it added? And you add it to the DSpace module at the same place. Yep, excellent. Um, let's see, I'm looking for other good questions here. Uh, there's a question in the chat, and it's also um, in the um, in the document around. Um, I'm planning to extend the OIDC authentication to provide authorization in DSpace. Can you direct me to development and uh, and deployment models to do custom additions? Um, I'm not sure if that's easy enough to answer here quickly. I do just want to say that I noticed that question. Um, I do think that um, there's good examples in our authentication plugins directory of how you can um, how you can modify the existing authentication plugins. I think that rather than trying to um, deploy it as a custom addition, you might want to consider uh, customizing it uh, within the main code base and sending us a pull request because I know this is something that others have asked for out of the OIDC plugin. Um, so that might be a recommended approach here is if you can work on the code itself and send us some updates, we can help see if we can get that into the next release of DSpace. I don't know, Andrea, if you have anything else to add about that um, or, or Art as well on the back end. If not, that's fine. Yeah, uh, that's really. Yep, okay. Um, and I can add more details into some into the questions in the Q&A document. I will note that I am jumping around the Q&A document here because there are some things that are much easier to answer live and other things where it's much easier for me to send you a link. <laughs> um, so there, I am purposely skipping over a couple of these that I know I can answer later very quickly. Um, are there detailed instructions for installing in the production environment with HTTPS? There are. Uh, we covered that a little bit yesterday um, in the upgrade. Um, workshop. Um, and there's uh, documentation and in the installation docs, which I'll, um, I can add a link to that if you add this into the Q&A document. Um, the easiest way to add HTTPS is often using a proxy in front of the uh, back end and the front end. So you could use Apache or Nginx and do HTTPS in either Apache or Nginx the same way you would do for any other website. Um, but uh, there are plenty of what there's other ways in the documentation that's listed out as well. So I'd recommend checking the docs and letting us know if there's questions you may have specifically about um, what the documentation says. And I will note on that note as well, if, you, if you're checking the documentation, if anybody's using documentation, whether it's REST API docs, um, docs that we have around how to work with Angular or customize Angular, uh, installation docs, upgrade docs, any of that sort of stuff. Uh, the documentation is really a collaborative activity. If you're finding things that are not documented well there, um, let us know. If you find something, if you figure out something that's not documented and you want to share it back, that's even better. We'd love you to contribute to our documentation. Uh, get in touch with me if you need access rights to do so. Uh, but it's really a collaborative activity to make sure that we're providing as much information as we can to all the users of DSpace. So that's another place that you can contribute um, directly to the DSpace uh, project. Uh, let's see here. What other questions um, can I ask into here? There are some very specific questions. I don't know if they're easy enough to answer. Uh, customization in Angular, what can be the reason for pagination not displaying? I'm guessing that there probably would be an, an error um, if you're trying, if you're customizing DSpace Angular and something is not displaying, usually that means there's an error going on. Um, and that is where you can find the error using our troubleshooting guide, which I linked to yesterday. Um, you can also find errors in Angular often using the browser dev tools with, 
which Andrea showed off, um, it's really useful with DSpace 7 to get familiar with your browser's development tools uh, when you're doing anything with Angular, uh, because you can not only see what requests it makes to the REST API, but you can also see errors that are appearing in the Angular application itself when you do customization. And those errors can lead you to maybe a bug you have in your customization code or something that's set up wrong. And there are also the information we would need to really help out with specific um, problems that are going on. I don't know if there's anything more you wanted to add to that art on that particular one on debugging Angular No, issues. not really, because <laughs> as you said, uh, I don't know enough to uh, yeah. say what the cause of this pagination issue is unless I've seen it. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, in debugging in general, we do have a great troubleshooting guide um, that we've worked on over time. And again, we can make improvements there. Folks have issues that with the guide, but the guide itself here, I'll link in here, um, step, steps you through um, trying to find errors in DSpace 7, starting from the UI perspective um, and going to your dev tools and looking for possible errors there, um, and also looking on the back end for errors that may be logged um, in the DSpace logs. So it's really important to walk through that guide when you're having weird behaviors, uh, because that can often um, lead you to what the underlying error message is. And the underlying error message is what is most important to us in terms of helping you debug it. Um, so if you find an underlying error message, it's very useful to share that on the mailing list if you need help or Slack or wherever. Um, and that way we can help you really uh, narrow down what the exact problem was or is. Um, there's a question here about could CSRF double submit cookies give problems with local installation for Windows development? They should not. Um, I, I can't answer the entirety of your question because some of this sounds like you may need to debug some of the issues. Um, but the only thing that causes issues with CSRF double submit cookies is SSL. And that's the main reason we have to require uh, HTTPS whenever you move to production um, is because otherwise browsers will block those cookies if you don't have HTTPS enabled. And that's just a security um, security setting in modern browsers. They will block any cookie that is untrusted in order to keep your browser secure. Um, and so that is worth being aware of. If you're attempting to use DSpace from an, um, an external machine and you don't have HTTPS enabled, you're probably not going to be able to log in because those uh, CSRF cookies and, and similar will get blocked and that will block the entire authentication process. You could do basic stuff like browsing, but you can't interact with the system beyond that. Um, and some of that was covered yesterday as well um, in terms of the requirements for HTTPS. And I'd like to add to that. Uh, Go ahead. I would, wouldn't recommend using a self-signed certificate either. It's easy enough to use Let's Encrypt nowadays to just get a, a free certificate because I've heard a lot of strange issues from people using self-signed certificate that get bugs that, that eventually turn out to be caused by that, have weird error messages. So I advise to just get a Let's Encrypt certificate if you can. Good point. Yeah, and Let's Encrypt is free. Um, and again, a lot of these issues here with um, SSL, uh, it's more around the browser behavior these days. It's not DSpace trying to force you to use it, although we would still highly recommend it because it's much more secure, but um, but it's really that browsers have become more secure over time. And so that's just the, the way, the nature of things to try and protect your users. Um, let's see, we've got about seven minutes left. I'm trying to see if there's one last question here that is useful to answer in this session. Uh, I'm going to ask this, although this may require more, um, more playing around in the system. I'm not sure what the answer is myself, but maybe Art or Andrea would know. Um, is it possible to replace the default badge in the item list um, by using a custom type ba badge based on the DC type field? So it's basically, can you change what badges may appear in a list of items based on a metadata field? Is that possible? Um, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I don't know if either of you do. If we don't know it's, it, we can always answer it later. Go ahead, It's Art. going to be possible. Uh, if it's going to be easy, that's not a given. Let's take a look. Um, so where's that badge going to be set? Uh, trying to remember where what component might use that badge. Type badge component. And what info do we have here? 
we have the object, so we have all the metadata. So it's quite trivial to just use the object uh, to, to do something with the metadata and have a different badge here based on the metadata. Excellent. So and yes, I it is possible. Go ahead. I think this will be teamable already because this is something uh, small. Uh, so you'll need to either change it here directly or make it teamable. And there's info on how to do that on uh, the wiki as well. Yep, excellent. So it's good that you figured that out quickly. And that is a good side note here is that it is worth noting that as you're building themes, there are some components in DSpace 7 that are not yet themable. Uh, most of the components you will find are themable. But if you run across one that is not yet themable, you either have to modify it in that core code like Art's saying, or you can help make it themable. Uh, there is documentation on how to make any component themable in our um, in our docs. Um, and we can also guide you through that. There's also old pull requests that others have done the same sort of thing. Um, that would be a great way to give back to the community if you find something you want to make themable and help us make it themable. It's not too difficult of a process. It just takes a lot of effort to move to make every single component themable. And perhaps um, a little bit of an explanation on why that is. Uh, it's because an Angular app is not meant to basically choose a different component based on uh, routing and, and all, all these variables we had. So in order to support the, the teams we had in DSpace XML UI, uh, DSpace 6 and in the XML UI, um, where you have like reg, regular, regular expressions that can determine which team you use, uh, we had to basically turn every component that needs to change based on the team, we have to turn that into an, a dynamic components. So to make a component teamable will basically mean to replace uh, the component that's there with a little uh, thing that says teamed version of that component, and uh, then then we can then it then it's dynamic and then we can play, replace it on the fly. Excellent. And so I'm going to wrap it up there because I, I think we've actually hit most of the questions in the Q&A document. There's only about 13 of them there. A couple of the others, I think, is are, are going to require documentation. I'm seeing a lot of uh, thank yous and, um, and things of that sort in the in the chat. So it looks like folks are extremely happy for um, uh, for what, what has been presented today and all this week as well, of course. Um, I will also note, uh, just as an informational thing, I saw about 400 people in here at once. So we had a very good attendance today. Um, excellent to see that that a good amount of interest and in, um, and wanting to learn more about DSpace 7. Um, but let's go ahead and wrap up for today. The questions that remain in this Q&A document will get answered in the Q&A document. So if you have a question that you are dying to ask, you can still add stuff into there. Um, you can also keep an eye on it if you've already asked a question there. Um, Art and Andrea, if you have a chance to help me out with any, any of them, I'd appreciate some, some chipping in on the questions for this workshop, um, but I will also try and uh, capture down um, what we have all already answered here uh, today. Um, so with that, I think, um, thank you all for your attendance today. As Natalie said at the beginning of, of the, the webinar today and before each of them on other days, we really encourage you to, to see if you can get your institution can, to become a member um, or uh, give back through our DSpace Development Fund or other fundraising opportunities, the SCOS fundraising opportunities. That is how we are able to give you these workshops uh, for free. It's also how we can keep DSpace free and open source from, for everyone. One. Um, along with your collaboration in the code, um, funding really helps because that does pay for my job. It pays for uh, Natalie's role as well. Um, and we want to be able to keep uh, making DSpace better for everybody. So if you have a chance to do that at your institution, um, we'd love it. For those of you who are already members, thank you very much for all of that. Um, and other than that, have a good rest of your week all. And um, thanks again for attending. And thanks very much to Art and Andrea for the, the great presentations today. I just wanted to add one thing that came up sure. in the, um, that was going around. Uh, Juan Victori um, is organizing a group that to, in order to share um, a virtual box or virtual instance of DSpace. So um, perhaps we could follow up with him later because it seems like there was a lot of interest in that. That's why people were sharing all their email addresses in the chat. Ah, um, okay, excellent. I missed that, but yeah, feel free to add the notes into the yeah. Q and A document as well, um, and we can see what what we can help out there with. Okay, great. Okay, thanks all. And I think we can go ahead and stop the recording here, Shania.
And thank you, Andrea and Art, again. Yeah, thank you, too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.